Web3 with me is a discussion style podcast about the ins and outs of Web 3.0, hosted by Zach French, known as Off Edge in the verse. From crypto to NFTs, DAOs to DeFi, we cover the abstract philosophical promises and the new business models enabled in this new decentralized world. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or watch the show on YouTube. Thanks and enjoy. Zach French is a bar certified attorney and nothing expressed by Zach during Web3 with me shall be considered legal advice. All the opinions expressed by Zach and his guests are solely their own opinions. All content in Web3 with me is for informational purposes only. Zach and his podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed during Web3 with me. I'm excited for my guest today, David, known as DA3VID in the verse. He's a lawyer licensed in New York and lived in China for 15 years teaching law and theater. He's recently completed a master's degree with a focus on philosophical Taoism as a framework for the metaverse and has been accepted into his PhD program to study metaverse sociology. He currently facilitates the Legal Guild and Education and Research Guild at City Dow. LFG baby, time to start vibing. Welcome to the show, David. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Um, I always like to start the shows with uh, a background story. I call it your founding story. So I um, would love for you to share with the audience, uh, you know, where you came from, um, and then we'll kind of get into uh, how you uh, entered the Web3 world. Sure. I'll try to keep it short. I'm just a guy who doesn't necessarily deserve some sort of autobiography, but... <laughs> I was born and raised outside New York City in the suburbs, and I started studying Chinese at a really young age when I was, that's kind of part of my defining story. When I was 14 years old, I read a copy, of course, English translation of the Tao Te Ching, the Tao Te Ching, right? So that's the classic book of Taoism written by Lao Tzu, and it just blew my mind at 14. I don't know why I was like ready for it. And so my high school was offering I think they had an experimental program to teach Chinese. So I took that, love the language. I knew when I went to college what I would study. I chose to go to a, a Quaker school because I really like the Society of Friends. So, and I really like the honor code and Quaker meetings. So I went to a Quaker school and I majored in Chinese. I went abroad for a semester. After school, I just knew I wanted to do something sort of beneficial. So. I was a speech writer for the New York legislature trying to get funding for shelters to improve weatherization, heat in the winter and things like that. And I would go in to the shelters with the team. I love this um, organization. And what they would do is they would hire people exclusively who were coming out of the shelter systems and they would teach them how to do carbon monoxide testing and once they had gotten their certification they were kind of cut loose and new people were hired out of the shelter system so it was a really nice transition from you know whatever whatever uh situations people were in to gaining these certified skills and there were only a few of us who were kind of full-time that obviously they just they couldn't even pay me really um i was working for you know below the poverty line i did that then I moved to China for a bit. For was actually, I moved to Taiwan for a bit. I came back to America and I went to law school. I went to law school at the University of Hawaii because they have a good program in East Asian law. And I was still focused on Chinese. I came back to New York City. I got licensed and hated it just right from the go, just from jump. I mean, I love the law. The law is it's beautiful. There's great writing. People are so passionate. It's hundreds and hundreds of years of intelligent, really smart people, all of whom really wish they were writers, but ended up being lawyers writing these amazing cases. And I love the law. It's beautiful. I always thought of it as this idea of how we could make the earth a little more like heaven, which I know is kind of a ridiculous grandiose aspirational way to say it but it was like i always remember in the federalist papers i think it was madison who said if men were angels we wouldn't need laws you know and that's the idea like we're not angels but we can envision what it would be like if we were and so we write that down and we just try to make it like that and it doesn't work but it's 
The goal of it is so pretty. The reality reality of it, far less so. So I, after just maybe three years of practicing, I had one really good job I liked that was in Chinatown. All the clients were Chinese, but I discovered quickly they were all in the Chinese mafia. It was fantastic. It would like, every time they would come to the office, it would be one really thin guy with glasses who did all the talking, one real big dude who said nothing. And more often than not, what they wanted was to change the title to apartment buildings because they would gamble a lot, but they didn't use cash. They used apartment buildings. So they were constantly changing title and it was interesting, but I was just barred and I felt like I, I can't, like it's too risky. So I moved to China. Now I went to mainland China where I ended up living for 15 years. I went to a small village first and started teaching English like a lot of people do. Within a year, I moved to a much bigger city and started teaching law. And then the third year I moved to Shanghai and started teaching at a British, like a recognized international university where I stayed for about six years. While I was doing that, and I discovered I love teaching. And while I was doing that, I had started actualizing as an artist, something I'd always wanted to be my whole life, but coming out of New York, I mean, the people in the subways are amazing. Like the people who play music in the subways are better than anybody you can find. Like, but in China, I was able to just do it. So I, I joined this group of all Chinese people. I was a songwriter, writing in Chinese, performing all around. And then I started a theater group in Chinese. And that ended up doing really well. I, I was teaching Chinese improvisational theater. I ended up winning a reality TV show and doing a TED talk and traveling around the country and performing in these festivals. And some of my people are my actors who I found in university and I just trained them. The style I used was something I kind of made up because I never really studied this, but it was based on Taoism. And some of them actually now are very, very famous they got onto the Chinese version of Saturday Night Live, which itself didn't succeed, but they did. For them, it was the springboard we see it as in America. So I absolutely loved doing Chinese improvisational theater. Then I applied to master's programs in America to study Chinese improvisational theater, Taoist theater, which wasn't really a thing, but I ended up getting accepted to uh, where I am now. And I just completed my master's uh, maybe a month ago. My thesis topic was actually, I ended up not studying theater. What I studied was Taoism as a conceptual framework for the metaverse. And the reason was, and this gets into the web three stuff. The reason was to me, theater and the metaverse are very similar in one key way. And that's, we're talking about the use of space. So in theater, you get people who walk on a stage and this is the space. It's me and you, maybe it's the props, it's the scenery, it's, and I do improv, so it's really minimal. And how we establish the space is our relationship to each other, our relationship to objects. If you look at something like Chinese landscape painting, you can look at it and immediately know this is Asian or Chinese compared to looking at like a Renaissance European landscape. It's partially, it's the use of color and perspective, but it's also really the use of space the relationship of the people to the objects. And in the metaverse, that was something that really engaged me is even on Zoom. So now I still teach. I teach at the undergrad level at a, a university in China. And now, of course, I teach online. My entire master's program was online. And this idea of where we stand in relation to each other on this two dimensional platform and I've studied some stuff about different metaverse platforms. And when you look at something like Decentraland or crypto voxels or Somnium space, and you have all this empty space, how is that used? What does it mean that, what does it mean that, he, that people come into the space? What does it mean that you put on haptic gloves or virtual goggles and enter this? What does it mean for proprioception? What does it mean for affect? Uh, what does it mean for the ability to engage with others? Does it make our conversation less real if we're avatars? Avatars are immortal, which brings them quite close to Taoism, in fact. In fact, they have all the magic powers classical Taoists wrote about. They can fly, they can live forever, they can do all these things. So 
to finish the story, I finished my master's. I just got accepted into the PhD program and I'll be getting a PhD in sociology of the metaverse. I found a professor who is super psyched about this. He really wanted to study the metaverse and he focuses on proprioception and consumption. So he's really interested in how can the metaverse change how we consume things. And he was just waiting for a student to come up and say, hey, I want to study the metaverse. And so I'm unbelievably excited to get that going. That'll be the next five years of my life. And I guess the final thing is during this whole period of time, I started working with a few different Web3 projects and ended up focusing on CityDAO, which is where I spend all of my time now in the metaverse or in Web3 space. Yeah, we'll double click on that one later on. There's so much good information in what you just said. Uh, there's a few things that I want to want to talk about. But before we get into the role of Taoism and Web3 and proprioception, which is a, a coincidentally like a, a new thing for me, like if, if you had talked to me a few months ago, I'd have no idea what that is. But uh, now that I have a child, uh, my uh, who sees an occupational therapist, I'm understanding what being proprioceptive is uh, and understanding the impact that it has and obvious and like really empathizing with like someone who is a heightened like a, a craving for intense sensational like sensory interactions um so that's really cool too um i do want to ask you this because you are uh an academic in this space right how do you define web3 for people when you meet them so I would usually have to give a little runway of what was Web 1 and what was Web 2. How do right? you define so, Web 1 and 2 then, I guess? Well, to me, Web, web 1 is static web pages. You can read it, but you can't contribute. A good okay. example would be the Encyclopedia Britannica Online. Back when it came out, you're welcome to read it. And maybe you can even click on hypertext links that take you to other pages. And there's a vast amount of information to be learned. But unless you're a coder, there's no interaction with this. It's completely static. Web 2 was this incredible movement to bring interactivity away from the coders and into everyone's hands. So it is Facebook, Instagram, Wikipedia. Um, couple, uh, there's a couple eBay or, you know, there's uh, all of these things and I'm sure Discord. Uh, what's this one I look at There's a oh, Reddit. Reddit is the only social media I will look at, which is a weird choice, but I do look at Reddit once in a while and all of that stuff, you can contribute as much as you want. And it's no longer about static information that has some issues with it because of two main things. One is centralization and the other is credibility. So for centralization, you can go and you can add information, but you have no control over what they do with your information. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to these big gatekeepers. And these gatekeepers, this is something I spend a lot of time on in my law class, is to me, a, the modern corporation is very similar to a vampire. It lives forever. It has no morals or ethics unless it's regulated. Its only goal in the whole world is profits. By law, that's its only goal. So it drinks blood, it lives forever, it has no ethics. It's as it's a vampire. That's great. We the have modern created corporation a as a vampire, right? Well, there was actually there was a study done. So I teach law and I teach organizational behavior. And I teach some management also, but for organizational behavior, there was a study done maybe, I don't know, six, seven years ago, where they gave a personality test to different corporations and all of them had the exact same personality sociopathic homicidal maniac that's scary it's very scary because corporations own vast tracts of this earth and potentially other planets as well and they are the things that are getting us off this planet they control food they control the climate they i mean corporations control everything and it's so recent we're talking about the late 1880s is when the Joint Stock Act was passed in the UK and the case Salomon v. Salomon established that creditors are not liable for the debts of a corporation or shareholders are not liable for the debts of a corporation and a corporation is a separate legal entity. 
a separate legal entity. We made people. We just made them without souls. So way to go us. People on paper. <laughs> people on paper without souls who control control everything. So you were, we digressed a little bit, but you were saying that this was web two. Centralization and credibility. So this is the centralization issue, is that you have these gigantic co companies that do whatever they want with the information. And credibility, when you look at something like Wikipedia or Reddit, everybody can contribute. Now that's great, but there's no way to verify what's true and what's not. Not to say that we could in Web 1, but when the Encyclopedia Britannica came online and you could read it, there was an assumption of credibility. Now that I think has just changed in our society. For my parents' generation, when they watched the news, there was an assumption of credibility. When they read the New York Times or the Washington Post, there was an assumption of credibility. That's changed, and maybe it needs to. Maybe we need to establish new forms of credibility, but that's Web 2. Interactive web pages that are controlled by centralized authorities that more and more lack credibility. Get into Web3. Web3 is a different paradigm, but I think that's what makes it challenging. It's very similar to Web2 in terms of interacting with web pages. What's changed is not that. What's changed is now people have their own ownership of their data. So that's a huge decentralization rather than all of your data being owned by Google or Apple or Facebook or wherever, Meta, excuse me, now, it is, now your information is owned by you. So that's one big change. And another big change is immutability to me, which is to say when information is put out on the blockchain, it can't just be changed capriciously by Facebook or by Google. They can't change it. It's out there. It's Transactions are transparent. And I think that's really important too. Wouldn't so that's kind Web, of Web3 kind of is attempting to, I don't want to say solve, but improve the credibility and centralization issues that Web2 faced. Sure. Yeah. I think so. I mean, and there's just a lot of a little lot to unpack there because the other one of the other aspects that I've talked about previously and is is that in web three you are what you do for the the mo more than you ever have been which is that and it goes back to that immutability characteristic what are you buying what are you transacting and all of that and to me that's the ultimate form of credibility now the way that we interpret that credibility is still up in the air it's everywhere there's there's tons of different projects that are trying to tackle what true credibility is based on the immutable actions that you take on the blockchain. But it is a step in that direction, which is that like, it's no longer the stuff that you're typing in Reddit. It is now the things that you are actually doing that determine whether or not someone should believe you, whether or not someone should spend time reading what you put out or, you know, even socializing with you. And uh, it's super exciting to see that that is possible. Now we have a long way to go, but it is still cool. Sure. Um, I wish I had it pulled up here, but I don't. But there's a great quote from Gavin Woods, who founded, was one of the co-founders of Ethereum, was the founder of Polkadot, and runs the Web3 Foundation. And he had said, Web2, he said a lot of people, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, he said, you know, people think about Web 2 kind of the way I described it, interactivity with web pages and things like that, but it's centralized. He said, he said think about it as feudalism. Web 2 is feudal society where you have these fiefdoms. You have princes. You have barons who own vast pieces. You can farm on their land if they let you but you have no ownership rights whatsoever. And with that goes a sense of you trust what this baron says, because what choice do you have? Either you don't farm and you don't eat, or you just give in to a very unfair system. And that's web too. We just didn't see it that way because it's so veiled by the technology. And he said, web three is simply a movement away from feudalism and towards a new social movement that can't really just be called capitalism. It's, it's a new social movement. And I think that's what makes it hard to discuss with people is, 
I talk to my family, for example, since I'm so involved in this and they want to understand what it is. But what they want is they want to be told, you know, Web 2 is a computer. Well, Web 3 is Oculus. They just want that. Or Web 2 is you know, talking on Zoom and Web 3 is the metaverse. They just want a very simple, tangible explanation to say to somebody it's a new form of social movement and governance. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the the classic example of in 1995 when Bill Gates was being interviewed by David Letterman. You heard that? Expand. I may have, but I just I was talking to my brother-in-law, and he was asking. You know, of course, they're making fun of me. You you spend your money making imaginary money in the imaginary verse, and I'm like, all right. Every he said, day I'm you... getting made fun of. <laughs> and he said, well, can you explain it? And I said. I told him to Google this interview from 1995, where David Letterman says to Bill Gates, what's the internet? And Bill Gates says, well, recently for the first time, we were able to, to um, stream a, a baseball game. I think it was a Yankees game. Isn't that amazing? And David Letterman said, well, I have a radio. You ever heard of radio? And Bill Gates said, well, okay. He said, but you know, with the internet, you can play it again and again, whenever you want. And David Letterman mocked him and said, have you ever heard of a tape recorder? And Bill Gates, and you could see he was trying to explain something that David Letterman, a very intelligent man, was not going to comprehend. He was trying to explain there's a new way of communicating and connecting with people. Anything you're interested in in the whole world, you could find other people who are interested and enter sort of rooms with them and places where you can establish connections in a way you didn't previously. And David Letterman just sort of mocked this and said, like, oh, you mean anything I'm into? And but the point was, now we look back, that was 1995. Now we look back on what the Internet has become and how it pervades every it pervades the fabric of society. There's nothing that really doesn't connect with the Internet. In fact, people are saying Wi-Fi is now a basic human right. So what what Bill Gates saw he was unable to convey in words. And I'm not saying I see that. I'm just a little piece of this machine, somebody who's trying to study it, somebody who's participating in it, working on thinking about new governance structures. In a lot of ways, all I do sometimes is I lead a meeting of very smart people and listen to them talk. You're good at that. <laughs> I enjoy <laughs> doing it. Yeah. I like, I like running a class. Yeah, I like... I'm it's the it's it's really hitting on your core skills, right? Like you've been a teacher for a long time. If you sucked at it, you'd be gone, right? I'm assuming that. Uh, and in our conversations together, not with like, the modern tenure system. Yeah, <laughs> touche. Um, so um, this is not something I often go over, but it obviously is a buzzword in the space, which is metaverse. Um, and I feel like you are uniquely equipped to describe what is the metaverse. And I preface this question with, I think when people hear it, they think uh, one of two things, uh, Facebook, whatever Facebook is doing must be the metaverse because it's called meta now, which whatever. Um, and then the other side is, you know, sandbox. It's a place, it's this virtual place where you have to be. Um, how do you define metaverse how did you work within that confine in when you were writing your masters um I'm, I'm interested to hear that so i was just looking to see if i had something printed out but i don't so my masters was 82 pages and i no longer have a final printed copy though i really wish i did right now <laughs> that's this a, a metaverse is a collection of technologies that's what it is it is not a thing it is a bunch of different technologies that work together, which is so I started my this section of my thesis by saying similar to Taoism, the, the first sentence of the Tao Te Ching, the absolute first sentence, Tao Ke Tao, Fei Chang Tao, the Tao that can be explained is not the eternal Tao. The idea that if you can put it into words, it's not it's not that because whatever this is, it can't be put into words. You're missing the point if you think you can. You're not talking about the right thing, right? Ming ka ming, fei chang ming. The name that can be named is not the real name. You can't put names. Metaverse is a buzzword. It's a catchphrase. It's an umbrella term. It, Web3. 
Web3 is yeah, used exactly. just simply to explain everything related to blockchain. And it's just right. easy for people to remember. So I don't have my notes with me, but Metaverse is a collection of technologies. One of the technologies is display technology, visual display technology on computers. That includes things like graphic in interfaces and GUIs, graphic user interfaces. That is what most people, when they think of Metaverse, they think of that, just that, the graphic user interface. You put on this, um, this Oculus or this sort of visual aid, and I'm then you, some sort of sorry? wearable. <laughs> sorry, I was just saying some sort of wearable. Right? Yeah, something and that projects can... something in your eyes that is not actually there. Right, and whether it's going to be in the future Google Glasses, which would you know just sort of look like a pair of glasses that you put on, and now you can see augmented reality. So the metaverse includes things like. XR, AR, VR. So we think of metaverse as VR, virtual reality. But in fact, what's going on now a lot is AR, augmented reality, which a good example of that was, was the game called Pokemon Go, where you could put your phone up and you could see reality, but then you could see things superimposed on reality. That's going to be really big in the future because it's going to be really fun to put on your normal glasses and see like a cute little jigglypuff over here. Not that I know anything about Pokemons, you know, uh, over here, like talking to you or some sort of avatar. I mean, it's going to be amazing when rather than speaking to a black mirror of a screen, I can put on these glasses and you, Zach, are right there in front of me. While you may be transparent and ghost-like and it's still going to be this really interesting development. All of that is graphic user stuff. That's just one element of the metaverse. Then we have things like memory and RAM. And then we have things like the internet of things. What will allow everything in the future, your refrigerator to know it's out of milk and send a message to whatever your phone saying buy milk, which itself just sends an order to the grocery store. And then it gets, I mean, just all of these, this interconnectivity, what uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who was kind of, people talk about him as the, the guy who founded the idea of Web3, he called it the semantic web. So he's the guy that's credited with founding the internet. Yeah, Tim BL. So yeah. Tim BL sort of said, there'll be this future where everything will talk to everything. And I love that because I'm a big, student of communication. I care a lot about how people communicate and the idea that your refrigerator can talk to your microwave is really interesting. And that they're I went all- down the IoT rabbit hole, by the way. Really, it's interesting. <laughs> it, it, right? It's so interesting. And once there is a network strong enough for things to communicate, once 5G is actually everywhere, I think something like that will be possible. I believe- Already it. with IPv6, yeah. our method of assigning names to different things. Mm -hmm. We have enough names. I forget the, the exact number. We can assign a separate and unique digital identity to every grain of sand on the earth. Because we need to be able to, if everything talks to everything, everything needs to have its own digital IP address. Like a catalog, right? So what you just mentioned, 5G and 6G, that's an element of the metaverse. Interestingly, right now, China has 80% of all 5G nodes. So we think of 5G as this sort of worldly thing. It's not. I mean, my, fi my phone says 5G. My phone is not 5G. Yeah, I don't no, believe that for a second. <laughs> I just know it's better than LTE when it's come on my phone. Right. Yeah, that old E that was on the I mean, phone. I, I have to say, I, one, of the, one of the most effective ways that I've been able to explain the metaverse to someone who is not doing what we're doing, right, is it's not necessarily a place. It's almost like a time. And the way I explain it to them is when I go into Discord, uh, and for those of you not familiar with Discord, it is pretty much like AIM on steroids, if you're familiar with that, or a different version of Slack. And it's where a lot of pretty much almost every single Web3 community lives on, on Discord, um, organized a lot like Slack, similar messaging thing. When I go in there, I call that going into the metaverse. Am I an avatar in like moving around and interacting with people? Am I putting on a wearable? No, but all of my interactions are virtual in nature. 
right? And at that time, I consider myself there. Uh, and it's an interesting thing, but I just, I, what I'm trying to do when I explain it to people like that is like, draw them away from having to buy virtual land or be in a virtual space in order to think that they are in the metaverse because it's so much more than that. I like the definition that was given by the company Accenture. Mm -hmm. They called it the nth floor of a building. That's fair. So they said it's the floor of a building where we interact in ways you didn't know we could interact. And it's not definable more than that. So that's similar to Blocktopia that created this 21 floor metaverse building, which is meant to be a portal into the metaverse for, and their graphics are unbelievable. They're using Unreal Engine 5. It's really pretty. But one of the huge problems with Blocktopia, they immediately sold all of these retail spaces for $100,000 each to corporations and rich investors. So it is exactly what you would think of in a shopping mall. It's not, it's still the metaverse. The metaverse doesn't mean there has to be some sort of socialist upheaval or anything. The metaverse is this new way of people interacting that could be through avatars. When I get on Discord, my name is DA3VID. And I just tell people the three is silent. So nobody knows who I am. I, I have other names. I have other Sybils if I wanted to use them. Sybil being various personalities you might have on the metaverse. So nobody necessarily knows who I am. I don't turn on my video during calls. I have a picture, a pro, a PFP. <laughs> Except for me, I guess I'm special. We right. A, a lot of you, you are the first person to say that. I, I start with video. And a lot of people that I, I meet are like, oh, video. Oh, I used to. Yeah. Because I'm I'm more comfortable with video and I, I'm so used to teaching and learning online that that's true. Yeah. So it would be weird not to have remote. your video on. Yeah. So much of your work has been remote and you've been doing this for a long time. I mean, I imagine you were teaching remote pre COVID, yeah? No, no, it all no, started you with COVID. And that's why it's so interesting to teach online because you can see that it's not as channel rich as the, the amount of information, the packets of information that get conveyed are much less, even it's very deceptive. Just because I can see you, I can't look in your eyes. And I know this because I taught theater online and teaching theater online. I just had a, a private student I was teaching last night. And it's like, we're doing a scene together. Or she was doing a monologue and I was trying to you know, instruct her. But if you can't look in people's eyes, even from a distance, it's so hard. An actor on stage can look into the eyes of someone in the audience, even if you're separated by 10 feet or more. You may not be able to look at someone in the balcony's eyes, but you can look at the audience. Well, on Zoom, you can't. It's, it's very hard and you have to actually have tricks where at certain times you would on purpose look into the camera at the same time as someone else to deceive the audience into thinking you're looking at each other and things like that. Look aside there. I, as I've done the show, found out ways to be comfortable with that. And I, I would like, I'm like, look at the camera, look at the person, look at the camera, look at the person. And I'm like, you know what? And, and Alan, and my, Alan, my podcast producer, uh, credit to you for this one. Just put the picture right under the camera. <laughs> and you know what? No one expects you to be looking right in their eyes, but that doesn't mean there's not value in getting the perception that someone is looking right in your eyes. And that is one of the hardest things that I don't know if any technology platform has been able to conquer to this point. No uh, and it's just not the feel. I did hear Zuckerberg on the Lex Friedman podcast not too long ago talking about how there a lot of the like real feeling that you get in a meeting comes from putting your hands on the table. And so they've started to develop like gloves or finger coverings or something like that to like really feel like your hands are on the table when you are in a meeting. And Makes sense. It, yeah, it's like, I, I just don't even think about stuff like that. Well, so, this gets so us into proprioception. That's exactly yeah. what we're talking about is a sense of when I get on a Zoom call or in Discord, what makes it not metaverse is it's so two dimensional. At any point, I can just flip close the computer screen and that whole world is gone. Mm -hmm. I'm in my normal world. This is just a tiny little 
portal or portcullis or something to if look podcasts into. podcasts go bad, you can just close your computer and be like, peace, Zach. <laughs> but with proprioception, you're there. There was an experiment done not long ago, which I mean, it was, I think it's a pretty commonly known one, but they did it where they had somebody put their left arm on a table and their right arm behind their back. And then they had a fake plastic arm and sleeve they would connect to your shirt. And it's obviously a fake arm that just sits here. And they would take two feathers. They would tickle the fake arm or stroke the fake hand and your real hand at the same time. They would do that for about 30 seconds. And you're just looking at your real hand and your fake hand. And then they take a hammer and slam it on the fake hand. Now, theoretically, that shouldn't give us any reaction because we're not in any way being hurt. And we're well aware of this. Everybody flinches. Some people say they actually feel pain in their other hand. Some people say they feel pain in the hand that's behind their back because proprioception is not related. Proprioception for anybody who's listening is just a sense of the body in space. It's kind of a really big general way to say it. How do you interact with the space around you? I gesticulate a lot. I move my arms. I move my hands. How do you feel the space? Do you feel you're, you're sitting on something? Can you feel it? Your feet on your floor, on the floor, your, your feet in your socks. Can you feel the clothes on your body, the air touching your skin? When we move, how do we interact with space? And how does the, how does that affect us in an affective way, uh, an emotional way. If it's raining outside, does that affect us? If somebody slams a door and wind rushes at us, how does that affect us? The, the use of space and being present in space is very important. Uh, Lao Tzu, who's the creator of Taoism, if it can have a creator, or at least the person who first wrote about it, he said, the only problem is I have a body. If I had a body, if I didn't have a body, I'd have no problem. I've had no problem. And that's similar to Plato, who said the body is the prison of the soul. This idea that we're locked in this body and our body exists in space. And what's really interesting, what I like a lot, is if you look at the atomic structure of the atoms that make up the body, 99 point whatever that is in an atom is space, right? You have this atom, if we're blowing it up, obviously, and in the center is the electrons that are spinning around in the nucleus and the neutrons and the protons. The distance between those things and the shell of the atom is, it's insane how, how, how big it is. So, and we are just made of atoms. So we are literally just 99.99 repeating percent space. That's what we are. We're space that knows we're space. We're conscious space. So if there is conscious space, which obviously there is because it's us and we're talking right now, is it possible that other space is somewhat conscious, though not conscious like a cat is conscious or a dog is conscious or you and I are conscious, but in some way self-aware? And that is kind of the focal point of what interests me. I remember many years ago when I first heard of Decentraland, I went on to see their map and I had bought a little piece of land, you know, maybe three years ago or something. And on purpose, I bought it next to Chinatown, which they call Dragon City. And I remember thinking, what would make something Chinatown in the metaverse? So if you go to Chinatown in New York City, well, all the businesses are mostly owned by Chinese people and the writing is in Chinese and the you can see Chinese people walking around and at the store they sell Chinese products and it's Chinatown because it's filled with Chinese stuff. What is Dragon City? Is there a possibility that when Chinese people enter space together, that space becomes Chinese? I believe it does having taught theater for over a decade to Chinese actors. I also taught it in English to foreign actors. And I can tell you from experience, <clears throat> whether or not anybody believes me, that when you have a group of, let's say, Americans who get on stage and they start a scene, and a group of Chinese people who get on stage and start a scene, there's a lot more different than just the language. There are subtleties or the culture. It's how we interact with space. Where And the same thing with a Chinese landscape painting. It's where people put things. 
and their distance to those things and how those things affect them. And it lends something much deeper that goes to our sense of what is beautiful. So I'm very, very interested in aesthetics and what is beautiful. Is Decentraland beautiful? Go on Decentraland, it's mostly like open grassland. These structures that people are building, are they beautiful? And what would make them beautiful? And I don't think it's just architecture. I think it's interaction with the space. I've gone in Decentraland or especially Somnium space, and you see these architectural delights, these things that are impossible in the real world and are absolutely stunning. But you go to walk into it and it's, it's, it doesn't feel right. Proprioceptively, it doesn't make sense. Nobody would design something like that in the real world, not because they can't, because they wouldn't, because nobody would like it. There was a guy named AIG uh, Chang, C-H-A-N-G, so Zhang in Chinese, and he in the 1960s wrote a book for Princeton University Press called The Tao of Architecture. But that was the name that he was kind of given by the editors. The original name was The Use of Intangible Forms in Architectonic Space. And the idea that what makes space so beautiful, and he was just, an, he was not just, he was an architect. And the idea that what makes space so beautiful is the relationship of being to non-being. And that all being comes from non-being. Now, when we talk about the metaverse, we start at the level of being to some extent because it's built on electricity, coding, even numbers are being. So it's not pure non-being. But my opinion is that the metaverse is not something we created. We found the technology that allowed us to access it, just like finding the technology for boats and ships allowed us. It's not like that part of the world didn't exist before we made a boat. It existed. We just didn't know how to get there. And once we could get there through ships to other parts of the world, it unlocked mercantile law. It unlocked new ways of doing business. It unlocked diversity. It unlocked globalization, not because these continents didn't exist, but because we lacked the technology to get there. To me, that's what the metaverse is. This place, the metaverse, it already existed. It's always existed. It's part of the universe. And as the Neo-Confucians would say, the universe only exists in our mind and our mind only exists in the universe. It's everything in the universe is just subjective. There is no objective universe. And the metaverse is just part of this universe that always was. We now have the technology to get there. And getting there will do for us exactly what ships have done for globalization and then airplanes. And it allows us to go there and see there. And that changes everything. Really, really impactful. I mean, I'm just sitting here and I'm just like trying to process what you're saying. And I get it. Like the metaverse has always been there we just haven't we haven't been there right? yeah we couldn't get there we didn't know how yeah yeah but and we still don't because we're just building the tools we now we don't have ships yet we have rafts mm -hmm. so we can kind of get there but we don't know what to do when we're there because we don't really have the ships we need to get there we're building that technology now but that place and that space, and I believe space is sort of self-aware. And what that space can bring to us as humans, it's available to us. It's a new social order. And I don't mean socialism. I mean a new way of defining how we make decisions and govern ourselves and how we own things and what it means to own your own data. Like most people, that's a buzzword too. Own my data. What hey, data? Like, oh, my name, my, my email address. And it's like, no, it's not just that. That's what's been regulated, <laughs> right? Uh, it's so much more than that. Yeah, like it's, it's true autonomy. And, and I don't think everybody's going to be comfortable with it, but we aren't asking 100% participation, right? This is about just people understanding what is possible in this space, right? Um, and it is just, it's, it's flatter. Right, it's less pyramidy. It's more flat, I think, uh, in terms of social order and what have you. So, that's really interesting. I want to switch gears a little bit because I think it's a great transition. Um, 
we discussed what the metaverse is and the interactions and how important space is in, in here. And, and thank you for that. What what is City Dow doing? I know you mentioned earlier you were you joined City Dow and you've been. I know you're an active participant as we've talked about it multiple times. What what is City Dow and, and what are they doing now? So City Dow, in its first iteration, the idea was an on-chain city, and the founder. A guy named Scott had gone and he bought a piece of land in Wyoming, 40 acres. And he got a bunch of people together. It was all sort of crowdfunded and these NFTs were distributed. And the point of it was not to make a profit. So there was no profit to the NFTs. They were meant to be governance tokens. Yet this piece of land can't, you can't build on it. It's kind of rocky terrain. It's really almost uninhabitable, very heavy winds, grizzly bears in the winter or something. I mean, it's not the kind of place you'd want to build an apartment building or you could, it's not even zoned for that. It's just a piece of land. And the question was, if everybody has a vote via this NFT, so it's an algorithmic vote, Nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows if you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or a Communist. Nobody knows your name. All they know is you have verified that you have this NFT in your wallet. That's it. How do we vote on things? Obviously, we, there's not much to say about using the land. I, there's the hope that maybe we'll put a totem on the land, a piece of art, kind of like the statue of Satoshi Nakamoto in Budapest. Put something that maybe people could go for a pilgrimage someday. Aside from that, there's, you know, it's a hiking area. There's nothing much to do with it. But what it has become, this project has blossomed into, we now have these different guilds, which are essentially teams. So we have a public affairs team that deals with whether it's Twitter or things like dealing with legislate, legislators in Wyoming. Wyoming created the Dow law, which allows a Dow to operate as an LLC. And it's one of the first, it is the first state in America to do that. Wyoming is a very progressive state legally. They're the state that first created LLCs in the first place. So Wyoming is, and they're very pro-business. So it's a great place to try out this idea. We've actually had uh, Senator Rothfuss on of the podcast that we have, City Dow Podcast. Shout out to Eric, who goes by the name of Meme Brains, who runs the podcast. And he's been interviewing, you know, it's funny, he started by interviewing the citizens and I was interviewed, but now he's interviewing senators because this is real. So when it started, I ran for city council, which I didn't really know what that meant. I also ran for the Roman Senate in Rome Dow, and I'm a senator in Rome. I mean, what does it mean? But so I ran for city council because I feel like, especially as a lawyer, a non, not really a non-practicing lawyer, but a lawyer, there's so much about the world that needs to be disrupted. And for me, a big one is education. The university system is crazy. I mean, I'll give you one example, which is publishing. So if I'm a professor, I am paid by the university, and I'm not a professor in America, I wish I was, but you get paid by the university to write journal articles, right? And publish or perish, you gotta publish. So I write this journal article that I was paid by the university to write. It gets published in a journal, the journal doesn't pay me, and the journal owns it. And now my university has to pay the journal to get use of the article they just paid me to write. What the hell is that? How did that happen? That I was paid by taxpayer money to write an article to give to a journal that they pay the journal and they don't pay a little. We're talking 50, 60,000 a year per journal. So it's absolutely inaccessible to anybody who's not in academia. You can't even access this information that the taxpayers paid me to write. It's insane. Not, not to mention, I've in uh, next semester in one of the departments, all the professors except one are on sabbatical writing a book. Nobody reads these books. If they had to be published by Doubleday or Random House or Penguin and they had to get readers, none of them would get published. I have one professor who spent seven years writing a book. I read that book. I'm just saying, not that many people did, or will, or should. You know, that's seven years of taxpayer money to publish a book for what? They're, it's like friends publishing friends. 
this university publishes that university and this person by this unit, but nobody's reading them, but it's all taxpayer money. Teachers are now being shut down. You know, there's no more adjunct. Uh, there's no more tenure jobs. It's all adjunct. An adjunct professor makes something like $3,000 a semester, not a month, a semester. That's around $12,000 a year with no health care. And you need a PhD to do that. That's students, $3,000. Students are paying somewhere in the area of $60,000 to $70,000 a year. Where's the money going? This all has to be disrupted. So I am proud to say I am the facilitator of the Education and Research Guild at CityDAO, and we are constructing CityDAO University, which is intended to be the first accredited university. We at CityDAO, one of the key things I like is we operate within the confines of the law. There are you know, hundreds of DAOs out there, and most of them are operating in gray legal space. Where are they? Are they, they're not really incorporated anywhere. They're you know just, just in the metaverse. We, we didn't actually define what a DAO is. Uh, if you have not heard of a DAO uh, and you are listening, it is a decentralized autonomous organization. Call it the entity of Web3 if you need a, some sort of easy anecdote about it. Um, it is uh, you know, a, a much flatter organization and it is the entity of choice in for all of these different communities that are rising up in Web3. So just, just so you know that, but keep going. Tell, tell me more about the university because that was actually something that you and I really connected over at the beginning. And you have a great analogy for why this uni building this university is tantamount for the success of, of City Dow. Um, paramount, not paramount. Close. Thank you, teacher. Um, <laughs> tantamount is equal to. Um, yeah. So one point I would also make about DAOs, which is in a lot of jurisdictions, such as California, if you get a group of people together and you just start doing business, which is essentially what a DAO is, if they do business, City Dow doesn't do business, right? But if a DAO does business and people get together and do that, that's a general partnership. We don't really need these new words. It's a general partnership. That's what it is. If you and your friends get together and start a business, a partnership is typically two to 20 people who come together to form a business. More than that, you might need to incorporate unless you have a license like your you know, lawyers can be partners in a 200 person firm. But most businesses, more than 20 people, you need to incorporate. What we are in City Dow, we're an LLC. We're an incorporated company in the state of Wyoming. Many DAOs aren't because by virtue of being incorporated, it puts a lot of restrictions on you. But at the same point, I mean, that's the irony. It's, it's so true for Taoism too, but by having restrictions, what you have is more freedom. When you have a society with no restrictions, such as anarchy or uh, different forms of nihilism or things like that, you don't have more freedom. I don't believe an anarchic society is more free because anybody can do anything they want. And how is it freedom for companies to pollute the oceans? We want to use the oceans to have the freedom to use the oceans. Companies need to be regulated so they don't pollute the oceans. We have common goods. I believe in regulation, not because I think we should control each other, but because we're not angels. You know, and regulation is what gives us kids need structure too. You give a kid no structure, they don't grow up more free. They grow up not knowing what to do with themselves. You know, these guardrails are important. America's a, not perfect, the American you, legal system. I can tell you this from a practical aspect. I'm reading a book right now with my kid uh, written by Jocko Willink, who wrote, he's a, a big proponent of discipline equals freedom, right? He's an ex Navy Ooh. SEAL. Uh, and we got to the chapter that explained why discipline equals freedom. And the this is a, a children's book. Um, and in this narrative, there is a kid who is struggling in life, he's being bullied, he doesn't feel like he's strong and like all this stuff. And his big uncle comes to see him. And his uncle is a Navy SEAL. And he starts to, and they basically, they go through it and they're like, yeah, if you listen to me, I'll, I'm gonna stay in your room over the summer and I'm gonna teach you how to solve your problems more or less. And it's going to be hard and you're not going to like it. And they start with what you would think. They're waking up super early in the morning. They're working out and all of that. 
And it gets to a point where he's like, I just don't feel like waking up today. And, and they start to have the conversation and they, and he says to him like, look, this is actually like you waking up in the morning and doing these things is actually creating more freedom. And the kid's like, how is that possible? Like you're making me do things. I like, that's not freedom. And he says, well, let's go back to your, your troubles. You're worried about a kid bullying you at school. You're worried about not doing pull-ups. You're worried about a, you're worried about B. What are we doing now? We're teaching you jujitsu so that you can take care of yourself. We're teaching you how to do pull-ups by working out every single morning. So by incorporating the discipline of practicing these things and getting better with them, you are actually more free from the worries that you had before. So in that sense, the discipline actually equals freedom. And, and it really is kind of the overarching, like it could be used to describe what you just said, which is that, you know, everybody's like, everybody's freaking out about crypto regulation and tax regulation and all of this stuff. Meanwhile, the people that I think are smart about it are saying, are welcoming it. They're hugging it. They're loving it because without that regulation, it's not legitimate. You're always living in this gray area where you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know how to deal with bad actors. Like you need a little bit of structure here and legitimacy and a little bit of discipline, if you will, rules in order to really thrive and in, in order to really grow this space. So you know, thanks for sharing that. That's, that's I huge. That. I'm also interested in um, Mahal Yisik and Mahal Yis theory. He's, I believe, Hungarian, his theory of flow. And flow is a state that people can get into. You know, it could be a painter, a marathon runner, a musician, somebody who loses temporal awareness. So if you're if you ask a painter, how long have you been painting for? They they're doing it because they love it. They might forget to eat a meal. They lose the sense of ego. If you ask them, are you painting this just to sell it? No, they're just they're doing it to do it. But and the state of flow is typified or exemplified by the feeling of joy. And in the state of flow, people are much more able to learn things. So they're trying to bring this into American education systems. Now, the issue is you can't enter the state of flow unless you're operating at a high level, unless a master painter has freedom because they spent all the years it took painting a human ear or a flower to be able to get to the place where they can just do it. And some people have that gift. Some people can pick up a guitar and after some lessons, they can just play. Most people need years of training in order to get the freedom to express themselves and practicing anything every day does take discipline. There are really interesting studies done about willpower. I know we're getting a little afield, but where it's very easy to lose willpower. So they did one of my favorite studies. They took two groups of people and separated them in a classroom and they put on some Saturday Night Live, which is a comedy show. And for one group of people, they said, watch the show. The other group, they said, don't laugh. Control yourself. Now, what that does is it forces us to use willpower. Then they took all the people and they put them in a room and had them solve these puzzles, like crossword puzzles. Now, they didn't tell anybody the puzzles can't be solved. They just want to know when will people give up. The people who used their willpower gave up much more quickly. They did another experiment where they told everybody, don't eat today. They had them show up at four o'clock. Half the people had a, a big plate of freshly baked cookies. The other had a plate of onions. And they said to the cookie people, you're welcome to eat the cookies. To the onion people, you're welcome to eat the onions. It took so much effort for the onion people not to eat the cookies that they used up their willpower. And the idea is we have a certain amount of willpower as people each day. It gets replenished sometimes by sleeping, by eating, by doing things we love. But you don't have like some people are like, I'm going to use my food willpower on this. I'm going to use my workout willpower on the gym. It's not like that. We have one unit per day that can get diminished. And the way to increase this unit is habitual and repetitive disciplined activities. Waking up every day and doing something in the morning actually increases our daily amount of willpower. And that willpower can be used on anything. It can be used. So this is why um, for divorce, not for divorce law, that's already kind of too late, but for divorce therapy, they actually sometimes suggest if a husband and wife are fighting, they leave work earlier and spend more time together. 
Because sometimes the reason they're fighting is they're using up all their willpower at work. And by the time they get home, they open up the refrigerator, the milk is almost finished, and they start screaming about something they didn't. If they had more willpower, they wouldn't have cared so much. But it's gone because we only have a certain amount per day. And the only way to increase your willpower is disciplined, repetitive activities. It doesn't matter if it's exercise or meditation or taking a walk around the block or getting up in the morning and making your bed, whatever it is, disciplined, repetitive activity increases willpower. I remember the first time I was exposed to that theory was uh, actually in, have you ever heard of uh, a book called uh, The Personal MBA by Josh Kaufman? Mm -hmm. It's basically the, the, the premise of the book is if you read this, you don't need to go get an MBA experience is better, right? Uh, yeah. But one of the chapters speaks to this and they talk about there's a reason people tend to gorge food at the end of the day. It's because they've run out of willpower, right? All day long, they've kept themselves eating healthy. But by the end of the day, they've made so many decisions. They've done so many things that have eaten away at that willpower that it's a lot easier to grab that extra cookie. Right. It's all stuff that I wish we were teaching in high school and that we will teach in City Dow University. Yes. This is the stuff that matters. I mean, as you know, one of our shared things is, is this reform of education. You obviously have a lot more hands-on experience, but I just see the need. So to speak to what you were saying before. <laughs> um, but, okay, so. The metaphor. Wonder, what's that? The metaphor that you mentioned before about yes. cities. And so just to say that, I know we're running short on time, but the way I viewed it, so everybody in City Dow seemed to have sort of a common vision. And I'm also a member of the Legal Guild. So we're working on contracts and licenses and making sure everything is above board and that we have outside counsel. You know, I don't practice law. None of us practice law in City Dow. We have outside counsel when we need a legal opinion. But we do use outside counsel because we do want everything to be above board. Um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of everything. So, but when we have this public affairs guild, this community guild, the dev team, of course, the legal guild, the design guild, the events guild, the, I'm forgetting there's a couple of others, but you know, there's 11 guilds right now. All of them are vested in this idea that we're creating a city. And I was working closely on the city council, which has now been disbanded. There's no longer a core team or a city council. We are decentralized. But I was working closely on writing the city charter and thinking about governance. And everybody's coming from this vantage point that we're going to buy land and create a city. Where my thought was cities get created organically sometimes. And the number one of the number one ways throughout the Western history has been the college town where you have an educational institution. And because of that, because that becomes a center of learning, around that, a town springs up because of the essential services that people need, the related industries, such as restaurants and food and things like that. And then just because people want to gravitate towards the center of learning, because that is a place where new ideas are coming out of. And so I believe, so right now we are currently planning our very first City Dow Academic Symposium, which will be held in September. And the topic is the Web3 College Town. And the reason is I have seen a lot of other education DAOs and we definitely want to work with them and work with student blockchain associations and Web3 associations and all kinds of partnerships. But a lot of the associations I've seen, they seem to be trying to develop education as its own little thing. We're going to take education and we're going to separate it and deconstruct the students, the teachers, the outcomes. We're going to work with employers and see what can we teach that they want. Part of the issue with this is it's hard to measure things. So I tell my management class, management is measurement. If you can't measure something, it's really hard to manage it. If you don't know what your benchmarks are, if you have no idea what your KPIs are, how are you supposed to, what's good, what's bad, what's success, what's failure? We have to be able to use tools to measure things. And the idea of you can measure somebody who studied coding or mathematics, it's quantitative. You can give them an assignment. If they can do it, they learned it. How do you measure somebody who studied history? You give them an essay and grade it? It's, for that kind of thing, you really need accreditation. And how would an employer 
know that we properly train someone to understand yeah. politics and economics. Uh, there's no test you can give really that is uniform. So we want to operate within inside legacy structures and make an accredited university. But of course, it's going to be online. It's going to be and in person. It'll be IRL in real life and online. But as we operate like in Zoom, I mean, I just spent two years studying for my master's. I met the other students in my cohort once in two years. I don't know them. I know nothing about them. They know nothing about me. It was completely ineffective as a form of education. I went to college, obviously before the pandemic, and so much of my college experience involved life, involved getting to know people and, you know, washing my own clothes and, and having relationships and exploring myself and trying extracurricular activities. All of these things were part of my college experience and an online experience that doesn't have those is just just such a specter or shade of real education where you don't just learn about the subject you learn about yourself and you learn about i believe in social psychology it's not just understanding ourselves it's understanding who are we around other people who we are is very different than who we are around other people and if those people change so re-envisioning what is the web3 college now sorry i just said we're quite mimetic Right, that's Rene Girard's argument, who was the uh, professor of Peter Thiel, who is very important in the crypto space, right? The idea that we just copy each other. And it goes so far that we're not just copying each other's behaviors, we're copying each other's desires. I think I want something because I'm around people who want that. We're all just sponges. Now, some people, because of how they're raised or different factors in their upbringing, their nature, their nurture, they can have a, a stalwart, you know, uh, wall against the influence of others. Most people don't. I certainly don't. You put me around one crowd, I'm more likely to believe what they say, especially if I have some sort of relational desire to be like them. If, for example, they are successful or rich, even if I don't care about that stuff, society cares. And I've been taught to care about what society cares about. So really rethinking the idea of education. So obviously we're not gonna jump in to make a university. We need to develop the constituent components. So we have the City Dow Journal is being launched. We have our study groups, our discourse. Our first one is actually tomorrow. Uh, no, wait, today. So anybody who's watching this, it's too late. But every Friday. <laughs> hey, guess what? That's called FOMO. You've already right. missed everything anyway. <laughs> Every Friday, 4 p.m. EST in City Dow's Town Square, we'll have, we're doing Vitalik Month. Actually, it's six weeks. All about Vitalik's articles that he's posted on his blog. And that's every week we have a presenter who's read the articles, who's brought discussion questions. That's how I found City Dow, by the way. Through, Vitalik. through Vitalik's yeah. article, Crypto Cities. He's really interested in how cities can be reinvented. And that's what got me here too is, People said, what is city Dow? And I said, what's a city? I think we need to reconsider that term. Is a city the place people move after leaving their farm in Nebraska to go get a factory job for the Ford company? No, but that's what it was. I mean, right, the reason the that- thing. How do you define the group of people that are achieving this thing in this space? Is it a society? Is it a city? Is it a nation state? Is right. it the community? I mean, what exactly. is it? That is one of the eternal questions. And, and, and the funny thing is, if you go back to your willpower uh, discussion, and if you think about the restrictions that language puts on us, right? Because, we, because of that, how we have always been taught that something is defined or what is a city in the past, who knows? Maybe there's a new word. Maybe it's metaverse. I don't so know. I'm but working on an article about that. Oh, you are? Okay. There's a philosopher named Sassur. Where do you Sassur, release your articles, by the way? Do you have like a website or something? I have one of them up on academia. And then mostly I am uh, i haven't released the others yet. They're all works in progress. I'll release my thesis. I'll, I'll edit it down. And But there's, uh, I forget his first name, Sassur. And he talks a lot about 
words and what they mean and the idea of uh, the idea that a word has a certain meaning to us, but that meaning has a certain meaning to us and words can't be black or white. Good is the opposite of bad. Good is not a thing. And by that token, flower, like a rose, is a, it's a word. But, you know, as Gertrude Stein famously said, my favorite poet, uh, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. I think she had four of them. And the, her idea was like, we say a rose. And what is that? That's a rose. That's a red flower. Sometimes it's white. But what is that? Oh, that's love. And then what is love? Well, now we're gone. So what is a rose? What are we talking about here? What is any word? These words don't have meaning. We are so limited by our ability to express things in a vocabulary that ultimately doesn't have much meaning at all. We're always looking for this objective, ontological meaning of words. It means this. We're done now. City means this. We're talking about lawyers here, both of us. <laughs> we make our careers off of what do these words mean? Are you using the best words, right? A well, Trump's got the best words, but we might be, uh, you know, <laughs> we be second best. All right. Well, listen, I know we're coming up on time uh, and you have to go be the wonderful academic that you are soon. Um, so I want to close with, uh, it's a similar question. I wouldn't call it like the same closing question, but, um, you know, where, what are your, I guess, plans slash visions for the next six to 12 months? And then in five to 10 years, where would you like to be? Where would you like to see Web3, uh, you know, in your eyes? Well, I can answer the latter portion first, because I was clear on that in five to 10 years, I want to be the Dean of City Dow University. That's, I'm clear, that's what I want to be. I want us to be offering a degree uh, multiple degrees, if possible, certainly we'll have something in DAO and blockchain. You know, we'll have something because that's our that's our specialty, our forte. But I think we might also offer a sociology class or a history degree or something like that. So right now we're getting now six to twelve months just talking about City Dow University. We have the study groups are starting. We have our first course is beginning on the fifteenth of June. So there's plenty of time for people to get involved. That is working with an organization called ArcaDAO, and they do metaverse architecture. And they're going to teach a course in how to construct buildings in the metaverse for beginners who have no coding knowledge. You don't need to be a coder. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a really exciting opportunity. And then they are going to work with us and create eventually a city building contest where people could write a story of what a city looks like, paint a picture, draw a picture, create something on the computer, and their team will work with us to actually envision these and turn them into metaverse structures that can be walked through and seen. And then we'll have a big contest about that. So we're starting the courses. As I said, the academic symposium is scheduled for September. So we have plenty of time for anybody who's interested, feel free to join the Education Guild on CityDAO. And maybe we can post our Discord in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. We'll check, we'll post the Discord and then, you know, how, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, you can just go there and just at me. I'm just David, D-A-3-V-I-D. Yeah, yeah D -A th the three being silent. Yeah. Awesome. We're also working on publishing. So yeah. we're working on a children's book and an adult's book right now. And I'm, I'm really psyched, especially about the children's book, where yeah. we're going to integrate all kinds of NFT technology into it. And, you know, I'll, I'll keep that as a, a, a treasure right now. I won't give away all that alpha. But there's a, there's a bunch of stuff going on in terms of different courses. We're going to have a course in how to read Solidity smart contracts for non-coders. So you don't have to be a coder, but everybody's talking about smart contracts. What is one? So we already have the person lined up to teach that. We have a lot of stuff going on and this isn't about us making money. This is about us developing a university. So that's, you know, a lot of my focus is on that. From the legal side, we're working on really analyzing a deep dive into the Wyoming law, now the Tennessee Dow law. There's talks of a Texas coming out with a Dow law. I think it's in Canada, I think Alberta is coming out with a Dow law. So this is happening all over the place. 
And there are organizations, there's one called Koala, which are trying to make an international, sort of what the Uniform Commercial Code is to contracts. So for anybody who doesn't know, the UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, is this sort of aspirational document written by lawyers and judges and professionals about what they thought the law should be. Well, that ended up being adopted by lots of different states and lots of different, pretty much everywhere in America and around the world. But it wasn't so written by legislators. teachings too, UCC versus uh, contract codes. So it's, you know. So can we have like a UCC for DAOs? Can there be this sort of DAO law that becomes national or international? And we, you know, we just want to be part of the conversation of all yeah. this stuff. And if I could be a maxi for a second, I don't think any of this would be possible in the traditional structures. I think this is one of those unique components to DAOs that was not, and maybe it's just the fact that it's brought it to the forefront, but there is this constant conversation of everything should be a DAO versus what things are better as DAOs. And because city DAO is a DAO and not just a company going out saying, I want to reform education because there's plenty of great companies doing that. There's just a lot more freedom to explore. One of the things structure of this stuff and in this, I mean, uh, not to, not to hate on my brother-in-law at all, but he's very skeptical of the space as is our most people, uh, web three in general. This is the value that comes out of it. This is the true value. This is not the get rich by Lambo when, when drop culture. This is the culture that's getting created by decentralization, by new entities, by people like you, right? I mean, this is why- I'm just I a small part. What's I'm that? just a small part of the team. I but know, I will but say you're doing great things and, and, and we need participants in the space that understand the link and that understand what is truly possible from this. And for that, sir, S E R, sir, thank you. You are thank welcome, you so friend, F R E N. F R E N. We're going on a rocket ship to the moon. Anyways, yeah. I'm going to wrap it up. I know we're coming up on time. Uh, David, thank you so much, man. Uh, it has you. been such a pleasure on the show and off the show getting to know you. Uh, and hopefully I'll get to meet you in person at NFT NYC. That would be great. Um, yeah, that would be awesome, man. So keep it up, right. dude. And uh, have a good meeting. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Have a great day. Thanks for joining Web3 with me. Make sure to follow us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Also, if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review as it'll help us reach more people. If you want to connect with me personally, you can find me on Twitter at offedge underscore. Thanks for vibing in the verse with me and hope you'll join us next time.